Three, two, one. All right. Oh, that was bad. Oh, well, whatever. Welcome to A Century in Cinema. I'm Arthur. And I'm Andrew. And this is a podcast where we discuss a classic film from every year starting in 1920. Today's film is from 1924, Douglas Fairbanks, The Thief of Baghdad. And we're calling it Douglas Fairbanks or Raoul Walsh's? Ah, I would call it Douglas Fairbanks. Douglas Fairbanks is credited as the producer, writer, and star. And I almost feel like Raoul Walsh might have just been his puppet. Yeah. Thief of Baghdad is available on Amazon Prime, but the quality there is not very good. I found a version of the film on YouTube that was a lot better, and I recommend you just watch it there because it is a public domain film. Douglas Fairbanks, just gonna go and get this out of the way. So hot. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> He's a gorgeous man. That was like the that was like one of my big takeaways from this movie. Those pants really uh, accentuate uh, his, uh, they're just nice pants. Yeah. Good pantaloons. <laughs> and his uh, questionable skin tone makeup. When I looked up uh, pictures of Douglas Fairbanks, I was shocked. I didn't recognize him after watching this movie. Yeah, he looks, he looks like almost Errol Flynn or something in this movie. So the year is 1924. Uh, I don't have a ton of world events going on. Uh, the one thing that stuck out to me was that in the United States, Ellis Island is sort of closed down as a port for immigrants to enter in the country. And instead, it's kind of turned into a little detention and deportation camp for illegal immigrants. But it had been sort of a place for immigrants to enter into the country since uh, 1892. And my own great-grandfather entered in through Ellis Island. I have no idea when my family lineage got here or anything like that. I should look into that someday. It's always a little interesting. It always feels so weird to think about, um, like, I, 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 do I have anything in common with my great-grandfather? I have no idea. 1924 feels like, uh, I mean, we're in the mid-20s, uh, and it just feels like, I don't know. What is Prohibition? What's happening with Prohibition at this point? Prohibition went into effect in 1920. So no one in the United States is technically allowed to sell alcohol. And uh, I assume bootleggers are running it. And I assume um, F. Scott Fitzgerald is uh, writing The Great Gatsby. Yeah, I don't have any way of relating that back to The Thief of Baghdad anyway for you. Oh, I know. <laughs> I don't have that. <laughs> the synopsis of Thief of Baghdad uh, you've seen this movie, actually. It, it, it's basically Aladdin. It's a it's an interpretation from Arabian Nights, old fables from the Middle East. But it stars Douglas Fairbanks as a thief in Baghdad who, as he says early in the film, just loves to steal, just loves to take what he wants. And the one thing that he eventually comes across that he can't just steal is the beautiful princess in a palace who he sees while he's robbing said palace. He decides to disguise himself as a prince in order to win her over. He joins a procession of other princes who are trying to win the heart of the Baghdad princess. There's a there's a Mongol prince, the evil Mongol prince, who is planning to take over the city um, by marrying the princess. Douglas Fairbanks as the prince um, does win over the princess's heart, but because he is a lowly thief, he cannot have her hand in marriage. He goes to a mosque, and the religious leader there tells him that he must become a prince, and sends him on a swashbuckling adventure to find the magic power to become a prince. And when the Mongol prince takes over Baghdad, uh, Douglas Fairbanks shows up at the city gates and with his newfound magic creates an army to retake the city and flies away with the princess on his flying carpet. Yeah, like that that plot you just described could be done in 70 minutes, no problem. But this is a two and a half hour movie. <laughs> I don't necessarily mind that. I just thought it was funny how like 
I was like, oh, wow, we're still just like on this journey, you know? I think that the first act of this film does drag. I think clearly Douglas Fairbanks is just having fun with his character and he he finds new set pieces for him to do, like he's hopping through the pots. Um, I love the pots. Yeah, there's there's quite a few little set pieces and moments throughout this film that don't stick out to me. There's big sequences towards the end that I do remember. So yeah, that first part seems to drag, and then towards the end of the film, some of the more iconic and memorable things go down. Uh, Douglas Fairbanks has said this is his favorite film that he was ever involved in. And, and you can see why. By the way, Douglas Fairbanks' character's name is Ahmed. I don't remember anyone actually saying that in the film. Maybe it happens. He's a movie star. You, you see his character as, as him, and yeah. he's clearly enjoying playing the character. I mean, Douglas Fairbanks started out as a, uh, a comedian in the silent era, and you can see that inflection in his role here. He has such great comic timing and this big charismatic smile. He, he really makes the, the role enjoyable. Yeah, he's definitely having a good time. Jumping around, and uh, he embodies that look of the silent film star, the grand gestures, and just so theatrical. I really I really uh, liked watching, because I've never seen a Douglas Fairbanks film before this. I mean, he's just famous as that sort of adventurous, swashbuckling character from this time period. Before The Thief of Baghdad, uh, Fairbanks was in Zorro and Robin Hood, he already established himself in this genre. Yeah, for things that feel uh, out of date in this film, you can definitely go with uh, the depiction of just about everyone. Douglas Fairbanks, of course, in Brownface. Um, all of the all the bad guys just pretty... Yeah, I think his name is Shang or something is the prince of the Mongols. and uh... Just this giant, like long thin beard that he's always stroking and he was an asian he was a japanese film actor of that time his name is sojin kamiyama but <laughs> it's not about the fact that he's japanese it's the makeup and the hair and stuff on him that's like oh great <laughs> oh yeah so yeah that's de that's definitely hugely out of date that's the main thing and it is a big thing in this film because uh, it's everywhere i do have to take a moment to talk about anime wong in this film i did not know she was in it um, I love anime Wong. She is the servant to the princess who's on the side of the Mongol and is like sort of playing tricks to pretty much help the Mongol gain complete power and uh, all that stuff. Anyways, I just I love talking about her because she was one of the very few Asian film stars of this time. If you've ever seen Shanghai Express, very famous Joseph von Sternberg film with Marlena Dietrich. Uh, her and Marlena Dietrich are both prostitutes in it and she's kind of forced to murder this man it's a very intense performance she's very good in it um she's a chinese american actress and she was so frustrated with hollywood she was constantly getting cast as these stereotypical parts there's this very famous book called the good earth which is about an asian american woman and she wanted to play the lead role in it so bad and was lobbying for it for so long and they denied it and cast Louise Rayner. And Louise Rayner was in yellow face, of course, because she's a white woman, to play this role. And she was offered a supporting role in the film and refused it. And then toured China after that. Uh, she had a very incredible life. But uh, she was involved in film there for a long time. And is just one of the very few Asian American actresses we have from this time period. And this is one of the more problematic characters she was cast as, which I'm not going to blame her for. They, these were the roles that were being offered. But yeah, as soon as she popped up on screen, I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Like, I was, I was just so excited to see her. Yeah, so I, I'm happy that she's in like such a huge, big budget, famous film from this time. That's This film, I definitely had a lot of problems with it as far as its depiction of race, but it's... It's, it's production design is so unbelievable. I mean, I, I get lost in this kind of stuff when I watch silent films too, when you know this is all actually happening in camera. That huge door that you see open so many times with like the little prongs that are going into each other and they it opens up and down instead of to the side. Oh, the spiky door, yeah. Yeah, loved that. And the underwater sequence blew my mind. That was all like glass, these big glass structures that were all spun by one family of like uh, glass makers. And I just love puppets. And I love monster puppets. 
And that big fish, it's like a spider fish. Yeah. And he like stabs it in the, <laughs> the face and like it powder goes everywhere up into the air. It lo- Like it looks like it's floating. It's crazy. I mean, it's probably smoke. Okay. Things that were ahead of their time. Definitely the visual effects in this film. I, I'm even watching this and struggling to kind of put it together in my mind how they do some of the scenes throughout this film. Because unlike with The Phantom Carriage, where it's the same effect uh, throughout the film, this has quite a variety of really impressive sequences that, yeah, I'm, I was struggling to really figure out how they were doing it in 1924. De- definitely felt the same way. It feels impossible, especially, I don't know, watching it today. Uh, the visual effects were so kind of groundbreaking for their time that their process was published in scientific journals. The way that they filmed the flying carpet was by putting it on a board, stringing that up with piano wire, and then flying that over a crowd of extras. That was a real shot. Uh, That was crazy. With the two leads on top of the carpet, uh, that sequence at the end And there's a reason it's so iconic. It's very impressive. Even the the army being summoned and it's happening like patches at a time. So you can tell like actual people are standing there while actual explosions are going on next to them. You know, (laughs) it's like it just looks like this smoky reveal of just, you know, creating more and more people. But uh, when you really start to think about it in a practical sense, you're like, oh, my gosh, all these extras are just standing here with these smoke bombs and stuff going on right next to him as the next group you know appears for the next shot it's magic i mean it, it's a it's like a it's like a giant magic trick throughout this this film it's really cool it does make me want to watch um more of george millier's movies yes because uh i just love the visual effects that they're incorporating from this time period yeah and that huge shot of the whole army once it's fully populated from overhead from the, the prince's point of view is uh, just breathtaking. There's so many people there. Uh, at least from this time period, rivaled only by D.W. Griffith's Intolerance uh, from earlier 1916. Yeah, I think at this point that still had the largest budget Intolerance did. And you see the you see the overhead shots in Intolerance and you're like, ooh, yes, that that is quite big and impressive oh yeah the depictions of egypt and intolerance are unbelievable those huge statues and stuff i mean you see the people standing right next to them and you're like how did you make that and then you know it all just got burned down everything in theba baghdad they just burn you know yeah they just uh you know they have no sense of preservation for their own history and keeping things around so yeah get rid of the set on to the next thing raul wash the director of the thief of baghdad was actually an understudy under D.W. Griffith uh, when he was making Intolerance. Raoul Walsh had been a cowboy that got into the film industry because he was playing one of the Klansmen in uh, a stage production of the Klansmen. So that's how D.W. Griffith knew of this guy. But really so much of the look of this film can be credited to the art director, William Cameron uh, Menzies, who is just incredible. Yeah, these sets are something to behold the art deco style that that seems to be of the 1920s uh it is is so cool i love that it, yeah all of the designs all the painted walls and everything looks so great and uh yeah i mean even just the opening sequence with the big rope it's so magical to see that rope stick in the air i know it's just a string holding it up and then they like cut it but like you can't see the string the film really does kind of belong to him and Douglas Fairbanks, I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. Menzies was the art director on this. They weren't calling this role production designer yet because it wasn't until 1939 when William Cameron Menzies was working on Gone with the Wind that the role of a production designer even uh, was termed. But he was the one who termed it. He's the He's the reason that the production designer is such an influential role on a film set because he had such a hand in the visual look of the films that he was a part of. Um, Gone with the Wind is sort of famous for not really being a product of the uh, various directors that were churned through that production. William Cameron Menzies was the one who was kind of leading that film uh, through its production. This was 
one of the first films that he was a part of before this he was working as before this i think he was working as like an architect and he almost didn't get his position as art director on this film because the producers didn't think he had enough experience working in the film industry but obviously I'm glad they got him uh, he goes on to have one of the the greatest careers in the film industry at least in early cinema in 1940 Menzies is an uncredited director on the remake of this film, The Thief of Baghdad, uh, and you can kind of see the influence there. Yeah, and the and that really is the reason to watch this film, I think, is for its sets and special effects and the production design. I loved Douglas Fairbanks, too. He's very charismatic. It's a good performance. And he has an interesting uh, career in Hollywood. He's one of the He's one of the big movie stars from this era. And him, Mary Pickford, and Charlie Chaplin would, of course, go on to make United Artists together. United Artists was actually the distributor for this film. That is funny to think about that, like, for this film, it was a bunch of artists who had no barriers, really, that were all trying to create this vision. Mm -hmm. And it definitely shows. I mean, it feels so ambitious while you're watching it, even today. Labor must have just been so cheap in the mid 1920s to to make something of this scale, but it's it's lavish. Yeah, it would appear so. You can see the money on the screen. Knowing that Douglas Fairbanks and United Artists were sort of the backing for a production of this scale, you can feel the tension maybe between the big studios and the star system that was sort of uh, emerging from this time period. Uh, people going to see films because they they loved the people on screen. They loved the film stars. So the stars know how to leverage that kind of power and make a film of this scale. Yeah, you know, the audience is the princess being manipulated by the three big producers. And then Douglas Fairbanks comes in to save, to save us all. <laughs> <laughs> The moral of this story is ri literally written out for you at the beginning and at the end, in case you forgot, uh, happiness must be earned, which is such a platitude. It's such a like, uh, uh, of course, but it's also totally uncontroversial and acceptable for an audience of Americans. And it, it's its own sort of play on the American dream. Yes, yeah, it's a uh, what even in the film? <laughs> leans into that moral really you have to struggle to be happy you have to work to get what you want like okay yeah and then it's just this guy who it's just this guy who steals everything and like he goes on this journey where he's assisted the whole way of where to go and like i wouldn't deny that he put in work but it it just feels like he's sort of following this path i mean even him touching the tree is sort of handed to him like he sort of falls <laughs> into it yeah yeah i just don't feel like that's i just don't feel like that's the actual moral of this story <laughs> i feel like the moral of the story is to like be wary of people with status and to understand that like people you know it's the same moral as aladdin you know that people just because someone is a thief or like someone you know doesn't have the best life as uh someone else doesn't make them any less moralistic or any worse of a person i feel like that's way more what the story is about but okay Work hard, be happy. <laughs> Let's just... The Protestant work ethic. It's the 1920s. We're all working hard for the American. Or maybe they are talking about making like such a large, lavish production from sort of a, not actually independent, but a semi-independent source and being like, you have to work hard to achieve this happiness. Maybe they are just talking about the movie itself. Um, I did like the little part of the tale. I don't know if this is in the actual Arabian Nights book or not. It felt like it was because I know that book is known for sort of having a bunch of moral fables in it. The whole moral thing of none of your gifts would have worked without the other one. So I'm not impressed with any of them. That felt like such an Aesop fable sort of moment. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I liked that, too. When the princess sort of shuts down her three malicious suitors because they all want to take credit for saving her. Yeah, I liked that part. One of them had the carpet to get her there. One of them had the crystal ball to predict that Anna Mae Wong's character would poison her so that he, so that our main bad guy could use this apple that can cure anything. Do you have, did you, were you able to find a review from this time period? Um, the review I found was from the New York Times, and I think it's really interesting. I'll link this in the description of the podcast. 
Uh, they, they call it a satire on the Arabian Nights, which I don't think this is like a satire or a parody. It's just an interpretation. It's a, just an adaptation. Do they defend that statement in any way within the review? No, they just say it's a clever satire. Huh. I haven't read The Arabian Nights, so maybe it is. I don't know what a faithful adaptation of The Arabian Nights Tales sort of looks like. And what I really like about this review is that they talk a lot about the audience that was watching uh, in the theater at the time and what they were really reacting to and laughing with and... The audience really loved Douglas Fairbanks here. No surprise. They were laughing. <laughs> the reviewer mentions that they laugh with the scene of the horse in the clouds, which I also did think was probably the weakest of the visual effects. Was the horse supposed to be flying? It definitely had wings, but it was galloping through the clouds. <laughs> I guess I did think that was kind of silly. <laughs> I, I'm, so, I'm so willing to just like give the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, yeah, it's flying. I get it. I know what they're trying to say. <laughs> Um, But this review goes through the entire film like it's kind of a plot summary and just just totally spoils the end. Yeah, they love it. They call it an entrancing picture, wholesome and beautiful, deliberate but compelling, a feat of motion picture art, which has never been equaled, and one which itself will enthrall persons time and again. You can see this film and look forward to seeing it a second time. Arabian Nights satire right there in the middle of the review, too so weird they just throw that statement around one of the things the reviewer mentions very early in the review is how they went to go see it at the liberty theater and it looks more like an opera it has this grand sort of feeling to it and that that feels very appropriate for hollywood at this time i feel like hollywood is leaning into the the grandeur that you can capture in cinema funny that they're also comparing it to authors instead of other films at this time period they're comparing it to J.M. Barry and uh, Rudyard Kipling and Hans Anderson instead of, like, other directors or anything. Mm. That's true. Um, I think you might have said that in our last review of Safety Last, that film is still seen as a weird alien sort of art form. Yeah, at this point. And it's, I think at this point, is actually, I think that this movie especially could have possibly been a leap forward from that. Of people realizing, oh, like I can get the adventures from my novels and my serials, like right here with this movie. The reviewer here does mention that something like this could never be done uh, on stage in the theater. Although I have seen some pretty crazy theater special effects in my life. Yeah, I would be interested. I would be interested in seeing someone do something like this on stage where they do do like these crazy practical effects and stuff. Mm hmm. Get a live horse on stage. Have it gallop across some clouds. <laughs> Miss Saigon, where they land an actual helicopter on stage. Pretty crazy. Yeah, people have been really trying to push that spectacle for a while. Mm-hmm. Spectacle. It brings people in. People love it. I love it. Yeah, even even though it's all out of date, I'm still right there with the uh, filmmakers and just appreciating the technical craftsmanship that's going on yeah a lot of cool lighting effects and stuff too it's really pretty like the reviewer keeps mentioning the audience that they're with right quote never has an audience shown its appreciation of such an entertainment as the one in the liberty did last night unquote this is one of the first times i have been able to easily find a review of uh the film that we watched from so long ago and it doesn't surprise me because The Thief of Baghdad has a ton of like publicity material and uh, just stuff that has trickled onto the internet uh, because it was such a big sort of Hollywood blockbuster production for the time. Yeah, and it, it makes you think that like these big spectacles, like they weren't really that common at this time. And now, like, every big Hollywood movie has to have some sort of level of spectacle. Oh, yeah. It's just crazy to think that, like, going in and seeing something like this and thinking there's never been a movie like this and there never will be another one, you know? Like, to think that in the <laughs> 20s. And now it's like, oh, actually, that's what movies turned into. Yeah, this this is kind of the standard uh, in Hollywood now. Everything's got to be sort of a Thief of Baghdad story. A very easy-to-digest obvious moral sort of thing non-confrontational that uh is just there to sort of 
sell the entertainment. And, you know, I, I still like it. I still find it very enjoyable. This is a kind of a, this is a kind of a silent film that uh, I would love to watch with a group of people. And some silent films, I enjoy watching them just by myself. But some of them, especially when they do have this level of questionable content, as well as like this crazy spectacle, it's always really fun to watch them with groups of people. Because, I mean, you just have to kind of be cool with the fact that people are probably going to talk through it. But people will watch the whole thing. Uh, sometimes if you pop in a certain silent film, it won't actually grab the attention of people. But this is definitely an attention grabber, even today. Yeah, it's 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 pretty long. I'll admit that. At two and a half hours, um, I am happy that I gave myself a little intermission halfway through. Yeah. I did enjoy all of the scenes, even though towards the end, uh, I did become more invested. The stuff at the beginning is still a lot of fun, especially with Douglas Fairbanks' antics, uh, where he's running away from the police and uh, stealing stuff in the streets and stuff. When, uh, I love it when he uh, when he gets back to his uh, sort of hideout and he just does a handstand to sort of empty out his pockets and he just bounces a little bit to <laughs> make all the coins fall out. I, <laughs> I thought that was great. Eating the eating the food that's like being prepared and left out to stay hot. Yeah. <laughs> I do agree, like, especially the final 30 minutes of the movie was like a big surge of energy. It had a lot more momentum behind it. Not a ton to talk about further than just sort of the entertainment value, sort of what it represents in Hollywood of the time. Yeah, it was hard to take any further deeper meaning from it. It was hard to relate to it. It does feel sort of like a kid's story, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, That might be all, though. That might be all I have to say about it. I don't know if I have anything else. Yeah. I was going to ask how you watch uh, really long films because they're an investment. For the most part, I mean, I do, I do watch long films frequently, and uh, I just, if I feel, if I start to feel like I'm getting tired, or I feel like I need a break, recently watched Vim Vendors until the end of the world, which is five hours, Jeez. and I watched that over the course of three weeks, three different uh, viewings, three different sittings. Uh, now, yeah, if if it's a super long movie, some I mean, my first time watching Das Boot, which is four and a half hours. One of the few films I can jump in and be like, oh, yes, yes, I have seen that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I I watched that. I started that at 11 p.m. thinking I'll just watch it for like a couple hours. I was up till 3 a.m. I could not tear myself away from it. I So every once in a while, I'll hit something like that. I mean, even Kieslowski's Decalogue which is technically 10 different hour long films. My first time watching it, I just started the first episode and I just watched all 10 hours of it in one sitting with like a few breaks. But I don't know. It's, it's sort of just, I, I've just sort of built up the attention span for it. Um, and then I, then I do see something like until the end of the world, which uh, I wasn't a big fan of. And uh, I, <laughs> I will get so bored and be like, can I still do this? <laughs> like, have I lost it? I'll worry about it every time. But then I'll watch, you know, the four hour cut of Greed that I was able to find um, through a very nice source. And it's like, oh, yeah, I can still watch this and enjoy this. <laughs> My method for watching long films is to start them early. I don't know how you can start a film at 11 p.m. at night and stay up. I, I, I suppose Das Boot is incredibly tense and gripping, but my my method is to try to start long films earlier in the morning. Uh because I, I can tolerate them a little bit. I do love watching an early morning film with some coffee. It's a great way to watch a movie. Oh, it's fantastic. Well, I think that's all we have for this week. I think that's it for uh, The Thief of Baghdad in 1924. Next week, 1925's Battleship Potemkin, uh, Eisenstein's famous Soviet film. So you can find that in public domain, or you can find it on the Criterion channel. Or HBO Max. That's where I watched it. Oh, okay, cool. Good. Was it a good uh, quality there? Yes, very good quality. Fantastic. Then we will talk about that sometime uh, next week. Thank you, man. Next week. Talk to you later, Arthur. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of A Century in Cinema. It's been a pleasure having this conversation. If you're enjoying this podcast and want to give us a little more support, go ahead and leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcast. It could really help us get the word out there. 
and uh, spread us to your family and friends, other people who might be interested in listening to these discussions and watching these films. And a big thank you to Nathan Royal for our intro and outro music. Thank you so much again for listening, and there will be a new episode next week. I just want to give a shout out to all our Patreon members who keep the show running. Thank you all. You too can become a patron and get access to bonus episodes linked down in the show notes. You're listening on YouTube now, so like and subscribe and comment down below. Tell us if you've seen the film. What did you think of it? Do we miss anything? Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you for the next one.